Even though the doctors measure Colleen's remaining days in weeks or months, she says she can still be at peace. I can be still in my soul because God is good and He's with me and He's designing these things for pure joy. Psalm 16 talks about that, eternal pleasures at your right hand. This is the Revive Our Hearts podcast with Nancy DeMoss Walgamuth, co-author of You Can Trust God to Write Your Story. For December 14th, 2021, I'm Dana Gresh. If I were to ask you when you've grown the most in your life, spiritually speaking, how would you respond? When have you learned the most important lessons from the Lord? Was it when you were going through times of smooth sailing, or was it when you were in turbulent, stormy waters? I think most of us can point to moments of difficulty and trials, and we can say with the psalmist in Psalm 119, before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. He said, it is good for me that I was afflicted, that I might learn your statutes. Hmm, so true. Affliction, difficulty, times when the road's long and hard, those are the times when we often end up saying we grew the most. I know that's been true for Robert and me over the past couple of years. We would not have chosen to have cancer in our story, but God chose it. Mm -hmm. And those have been some of the sweetest growing times in our marriage and in my relationship with the Lord as well. So I look back and I I thank Him for those times, for those hardships. And I think about another woman that we heard from yesterday whose life illustrates this beautifully. Her name is Colleen Chow. We heard yesterday about some of the ways that God has been stretching her in her journey through stage four cancer, especially as it relates to her love for her husband and her 10-year-old son. If you missed that episode, I want to encourage you to go back and listen to it. You can catch it on the Revive Our Hearts app or at reviveourhearts.com. It's a deeply moving story. Some members of our team traveled to the child's home in Idaho to sit down with her and talk about some of the things the Lord has been teaching her in these days of uncertainty and suffering. And my prayer is that no matter what you're going through right now, Colleen's faith and what she's discovering of the faithfulness of God will be a strong encouragement to you. I've talked often about the crushing of Colleen because I, man, at 18 years old, I had the world on a string. I, I was going to change the world. I, I was either going to be a missionary or a pastor's wife. I, I was so ambitious and driven, and it, it was good stuff. You know, I, um, it was stuff God had put on my heart, but it was so full of me still that in my 20s began a journey. Um, probably even from 18 years old on, began a journey of being humbled. And I've just said over and over again, being crushed because God has not let up, I would say for probably 25 years of sending me circumstances and situations that would sift me out of, out of things and make sure that His dreams were my dreams and not my dreams taking the shape of me and what I thought it would look like to minister to people or what ministry meant. And he was he was rewriting those things and redefining what it meant to walk with him and serve people and love people. And he's done that through hardship. For Colleen, that hardship came in the form for a time of singleness. It also came in the form of chronic illness and the health challenges that her son faced. Now, Colleen is continuing to learn to submit to God's will as she faces terminal cancer. She says that one thing that affected her perspective was reading Christian biographies. You know what has shaped me, besides Scripture, beside an intimate relationship with Christ and experiencing His presence has been um, the stories of past saints, past believers, who grew up in a context that they suffered far beyond anything I've ever suffered. Um, And their lives 
I always go back to their stories, especially in times of acute suffering, and it puts things in perspective for me, and it kind of helps me to have a little bit of a lighter heart and a, a more measured perspective on my own suffering to reflect on these people who, they did count it all joy. I mean, you go back to Paul, who, who was happy. He considered it a privilege to suffer for Christ's name. We don't do that. That's not, that is not in our natural response. Like, oh, I'm so grateful. <laughs> God has counted me worthy of suffering for him. Like that is, that's not my inclination. But when I study the lives of these believers who went before me and suffered in such Incredible. I mean, the lives of John Payton. You you read about all the losses in his life, and all the health issues, and the near death experiences, and the relationships that you know the missionaries that would leave the field, and he was alone. You, it was just one loss after another, grief after another loss. And I'll read a biography like that, and I'm strengthened, and I can kind of go into another day with a lighter heart and be able to laugh and be able to remember who I am. God's created me to suffer and to enter into the fellowship of his sufferings. That's why I'm here. It's not to have a comfortable life. It's not to have ease. It's not to be successful or be an influencer. That's He's called me to enter in, like C.S. Lewis said, further up and further in. And so that's joy. To be in Christ's presence is joy, and Christ's presence is often most, for me, most keenly felt in suffering. There is a unique joy and purpose and mission when I'm walking closely with Him in suffering. I think through suffering, the joy has increased instead of decreasing or, or fading. God's been gracious, and I think it's the result of surrounding myself with the stories of those past believers who, who model for me what it means to suffer in joy. Suffering has been freeing. When left to my own devices, the bent is toward that pride and that selfishness and short-sightedness. But when suffering comes, and it's come in different forms over the years, it forces me into Christ. It doesn't give me an option. It's either, it's where else can I go, Lord, right? Well, you have the words of life. And those words of life are alive when life is hard. And they're not as, I don't feel them as keenly when life is good and easy. And so the suffering forces me into Christ, it's like what Spurgeon said, I've learned to kiss the wave that dashes me against the rock of ages. And he has used sufferings to force me into himself, and that is freedom. You know, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. And for me, it's taken hardship to force me into him, to force me to experience him and his love like I could never have experienced had life been easy. <laughs> the suffering has been fashioned by God to take away the calling stuff that doesn't need to be there so that then I can live out of the heart that he has given me, that I can truly be the calling he's been growing me more and more to be like him and not have those small dreams, like C.S. Lewis says, you know, it's like a child being content to play in a slum, in a mud pile in a slum, instead of a vacation, a dream vacation. And I think in the early years, I was content with the mud slum of my dreams instead of understanding God's dreams are so much greater and so much more beautiful and, and they last into eternity. So the crushing has had to happen so that I could live into His eternal realities and dreams for me. Psalm 90.12 says, So teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. 
As Colleen faces what, humanly speaking, looks like the end of her earthly days, she says that verse has meant a lot to her. I have never felt the reality of that more than now, just knowing that there aren't many days left according to the information we have right now. So knowing that makes not only the days feel sacred and weighty, but the hours and the mo- there are moments that just, I'm just soaking it all in in a new way and knowing how fragile this life is and how it goes in a blink, whether it's 20 years or 90 years, it's, it's fast. It's all the scriptures that talk about being a vapor or it, my life is a hand breadth or inches long, or a mist that disappears, a grass that's mown overnight. You know, it's just, these are realities for all of us, but it's when you're faced with the reality that this is, this is coming soon for me, most likely it seems, then it, those truths take on a whole new um, weight and reality. He has put eternity into our hearts. Who said, maybe Augustine said that? So eternity has been wired into me, just the thoughts and and longings. I think probably over the last 10 or 15 years. And now it's, it's interesting. There's a part of it that's almost intimidating now. Now that this reality, and that's a strange thing to say when I have longed for it so much. And honestly, if it weren't for my husband and son, I would love to go today. I wouldn't even do chemo. I'd go. <laughs> There's, I can't wait on one hand. On the other hand, there is this sobering reality of I've squandered so, you know, I feel like I've invested so much and then I've squandered so much and just all the things that um, the reality is so near and so real now that I'm, I'm sobered by entering in and realizing how much might burn up, you know, and, and not be the gold that remains. And that's, that's hard to um, face that reality. But the gospel is definitely the hope here. And I, I think knowing that This is good news, you know, despite my failures, despite the things that I would love to have a do-over and maybe the regrets. The gospel is the the hope of entering into Jesus' presence without shame, without fear. Of course, a fear of Him, right? And awe. Who knows? Maybe I'll be flat on my face when I enter his presence, or I don't know, it's crazy to think about, but that idea that I have been forgiven and I'm accepted and loved and as the Father loves Jesus, He loves me? What? That is crazy stuff in John, is that 15, 14, 15, 16, just the oneness with Christ and with the Trinity that we experience because He took our sin and did away with it and doesn't see us through it. And I see myself through my sin often, but just to think that He sees me through Christ. And when I enter eternity, I don't enter judgment. Like, that's incredible. It's, it's done. It's finished. And this is the beginning, you know, that new life, this is the beginning of it. And it's going to explode into being when I enter on the other side. That's incredible, that I don't have to wonder, I don't have to question, I don't have to fear. I find that what helps me stay grounded in the storms is multifaceted. It's not one thing, it's a bunch of things that I think over the years, God's kind of, you know, put different handles together for me. And one of them is staying connected with my people and making sure, because I can fly off the handle pretty quickly. (laughs) I can go dark pretty quickly and I can withdraw and become private. I'm naturally a private person, but my people help me, my best friends and family help me to 
remember who I am and God's faithfulness and what's true. So staying in joyful relationships with people who just take the pressure off. They're, it's low expectation. They're not, they're not high maintenance. They're just, they're forgiving and gracious and, and they're full, they're amazing people. I don't deserve them, but they're the people who, who walk with me through this. And um, another thing is the gratitude, staying in the word, whether I feel like it or not. And it's not staying in the word to have more head knowledge about the Bible, but to engage with God in season and out, out of season, if I can say it that way, just uh, no matter how I feel that I'd be in the word every day and that that would be, um, that's soul food. That's in Deuteronomy, it says, these are not idle words. This is your life. It's, it's the very life in me. So I can't do without that the word. Even, you know, there are times through this grieving process where I don't want to pick up my Bible. I just, I'd rather check out and, you know, do something that doesn't require any effort. But to, to stay engaged with Jesus in his word is everything that keeps me grounded. Making a happy moment or, you know, dancing with my son or laughing with my husband or going for a walk and looking for beauty and trying to amplify that in my heart, like making a l much ado about beauty <laughs> instead of letting my thoughts stay on the darkness and the hardness. Um, the song, Be Still My Soul, has ministered so deeply to me. It's, I mean, the hymns are so rich in their lyrics, but the idea that thorny ways lead to a joyful end, uh, that is... That's everything. And I think when I began to experience thorny ways in my 20s and I was shocked, I thought, what's happening? This is not what I signed up for. This isn't what I dreamed of, right? God, you've got a different plan than this, right? But to walk through so many different thorny ways over maybe the past 25, 27 years and come to deeply long for and value the fact that heaven works backwards has been a theme. C.S. Lewis talks about that in the, his book, The Great Divorce, that, and I'm getting a little off track from the song, but I'll bring it around, where when we're in heaven, we're going to look back and see that the agonies were glories all along and that the reality of heaven was there all along. We just couldn't see it. And so I think songs like Be Still My Soul brings that heavenly reality into song. Like, I can be still in my soul because God is good and He's with me and He's designing these things for pure joy. Psalm 16 talks about that, eternal pleasures at your right hand. That's Colleen Chow speaking with some of the Revive Our Hearts production team in her home. I, I can't tell you what an incredible blessing it was to have Colleen join us in October for our Revive 21 conference in Indianapolis. Yeah, it kind of happened close to the last minute. Colleen emailed me and she said, it's been on my bucket list to come to a Revive Our Hearts conference. She lives out on the West Coast, and our conferences are in the Midwest, and she's followed them, but she's never been able to attend one in person. Mm. And she said to me, I just asked my husband, do you think it's crazy for me to try to go to that conference? Well, Eddie gave her his blessing, and she flew by herself, weak as she is, to Indianapolis. She arrived the night before the conference started and was there with us through the whole weekend. And she said in advance, I don't know if I'll be able to sit through all of these sessions. She just has waves of weakness and tiredness. So we arranged just off the uh, main room to have a place with a comfortable chair where she could sit when she got tired. But she was there on the front row for most of that event. Mm -hmm. And Dana, I remember as we were singing many different songs led by Shane and Shane, how many of those songs talk about 
the day when we will see the Lord. Yeah. And at one point, I was sitting next to Colleen, and she had tears streaming down her cheeks, her hands lifted in worship and praise to the Lord. Through that thin, weak body, you saw what I'm talking about. Yeah, I saw that. It was so moving to see her singing that with a faith that we can't really imagine or understand. Yeah, because she knows that, humanly speaking, that's what's just ahead. Mm -hmm. And it's hard, it's painful, but it's also beautiful and good. And during that event, we had the chance to share a 10-minute video that our team produced about what Colleen is going through right now. It also included some glimpses of Eddie, her husband, and Jeremy, her precious son, talking about what this experience is like for them. And after we showed that video, well, I don't think there was a dry eye in that room. Not a single one. In fact, I remember, Nancy, as the video ended and the lights came up in that room, there you were. You were standing right next to Colleen. You could see that was a thin, frail body, but oh, what a smile was beaming out from under that fabric-wrapped hat topped with a ball cap. I've never seen a smile that true, that life-giving I don't think, in my life. Just, it was a precious, holy moment as you stood there with her. And then you visited with her and prayed for her. Yeah, it's so encouraging for me to hear Colleen giving glory to God in the midst of these excruciatingly difficult circumstances. And I love hearing how she is anchoring her soul to the timeless truth of God's Word. That's what's grounding her. That's what's giving her hope and courage even through the tears. Well, here at Revive Our Hearts, we're committed to bringing you that timeless truth, no matter what season you may be in. So if you've ever donated to support Revive Our Hearts, you've played a part in us being able to encourage and reach the hearts of women in every season of life around the world. So can I just say thank you for your support? You may be aware that nearly half of the donations we receive every year come in the month of December. So this month is crucial to how much ministry we're able to fund in the coming year. We're asking the Lord this month to provide a total of $2.8 million. And we're praising Him for a strong response thus far. Half of that amount, $1.4 million, has come in the form of a matching gift challenge from some friends of this ministry. Here's how it works. When you donate to Revive Our Hearts, A donation equal to yours is drawn from that pool of $1.4 million. So if you give $20 between now and December 31st, your donation will be matched with another $20. If you give $200, it becomes $400. And once we reach that $1.4 million this month, we will have made it to the total goal of $2.8 million. For more information on where we are in meeting that goal, You can go to reviveourhearts.com and check out the progress bar, which is being updated regularly. And I want to say thank you so much for your prayers and your financial support at this important time. You can make your donation at our website. Again, it's reviveourhearts.com, or you can call us at 1-800-569-5959. That's 1-800-569-5959. It's easy to let Christmas come and go without a sense of wonder at what God did when He sent His Son to become one of us. Tomorrow on Revive Our Hearts, Nancy's going to help us recapture the wonder of the Incarnation as she examines a familiar Christmas carol. O come, O come, Emmanuel. I hope you'll join us for that.
Revive Our Hearts with Nancy DeMoss-Walgamuth is calling you to freedom, fullness, and fruitfulness in Christ.